welcome to the next episode of the Saddle Podcast, the sitcom archive deep dive overdrive, where we take a deep delve into the comedies of the 1970s and 80s. Um, we're still on The Good Life at the moment. We're up to Series 3, Episode 4. You're going to introduce yourself. <laughs> oh, I will do, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself there. I am Alison Barton-Simmons, your co-host. Where are you going now? <laughs> that's, that, that's my new catchphrase. Was that I'm, your new catchphrase? Yeah, do you like it? I'm Eggs Benedict. <laughs> can, can, can just do that again, please. Where are you going now? <laughs> what's, what's that off? Have you, do you, know, do you know, I thought you'd know that one. Do you remember a TV adaption from the early 80s called The Machine Gunners? It was like a kid's program. No. Adapted from a book about these kids I don't, who I find... I don't know this. No. Oh, it's a really good watch, actually. It stands up as well. And um, these kids find a machine gun from a... It was set in a war uh, mm. and a crash plane and they repair it and they basically set up a fort and start shooting shit, basically. And um, God, that sounds horrendous. Yeah, it's... There's some pathos in it but um mm. there's a character in it who's a, you wouldn't get away with him now he's described as simple his name's john okay and and the only thing he could say is where are you going now <laughs> <laughs> so whenever he has a line imagine being the actor who um, he's like oh, i've got a part brilliant and the script comes through well let's say what my lines are and it's just where are you going now? It's the only <laughs> thing he says. Just ten times. Yeah. Oh, I know. I don't remember that. Was it what? Was it just on TV or was it part of like schools telly? Um, I think it, I know it has been shown in schools because it's ah, obviously right. a historical thing. I think it was BBC. Was it? Yeah, eighty three. So you'd have been what uh, four? Maybe a bit four. Premature, a bit for young. You. Mm, I was going to guess at Johnny Racer when you when you said that because that's the only sort of like north east. TV show that I remember apart from Packy Grove. Well, it sounds a little bit like maybe Vic Reeves used it as the inspiration for that character, <laughs> you know, when he goes, I know that. I'm not bothered. I don't know, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It's, it's obviously made an impression though, on you? I yeah. like that though. I like that as a catchphrase. I like right, it. Well, I'll, I might keep that one up and get keep rid it. of Fred Truman. Oh, <laughs> I'll, miss, I'll miss Fred though. Oh, so we're up to um, series three, episode four of. of the jolly old good life. Um, episode is called I Talk to the Trees. Yeah, I enjoyed this one, did you? I did, yeah. I think it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I did. I really like it. I'm really into this current run we're in. There's some I goals, am too. Isn't there? This one, 16.7 million viewers when it was first on TV in October 76. Not bad at all, eh? Oh, God, you could dream of that. That's like just numbers of your dreams now, isn't it, of, of watchers? Yeah, I wonder how many... Um, People have streamed this episode on BritBox since it went on to BritBox. I wonder if ah, it's still got such an audience. I wonder if that information's public. I might be able to have a look. Have a look. Report back. So if you've got BritBox, you can watch it, of course, and then listen along to us. And if you haven't got BritBox, fear not. Some um, some dodgy pirate bastard uploaded them all to Dailymotion years ago. And we we tweet out and Facebook and Instagram, not Instagram because you can't do links on Instagram. But we 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 share the links anyway <laughs> weekly so that you can um you can easily watch the episode before you listen to us. Or you can buy it on DVD, which I did, and I started watching them initially, and now I just watch them on Daily Motion because it's so much easier. Oh dear. <laughs> and hey, is there any extras on the DVD? Is there like you know? I think there. I think so. Actually, there's all four series. Um, I think the Christmas specials are on there as well. I will have to have a have a have a look. It's been that long since I've I've had it out. I'll just stick it on Daily Motion. Have a look to see if there's any um if there's any like the extras. Uh, I was thinking like uh what do I mean like um director's commentary. Oh right. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? If you just had uh, I don't know uh, Penelope Keith and oh chatting along. Yeah, saying where she got all her outfits from. Oh. <gasps> Probably isn't. I will report back. Okay. And on that subject, actually, while we're on that subject, there was, um, I, I don't, I've mentioned this to you before, I think, Al, there was a show on, an ill-fated show, didn't do very well, about 12, 13 years ago called Beyond the Box. It was just a series yes. of specials that followed iconic characters to show you how that, you know, basically what they'd done after their story arc had come to an end in the sitcoms they were in. Yes. So there was one for Fletch from from Porridge. And um, Ronnie Barker, because this was before he died, he made a little guest appearance in it. 
And there was one for Margot. Beyond the box, Margot led better. Now, try as I might, I've not been able to find it anywhere online. Because I think it'd be a good thing to deep dive after the last episode. Oh, gosh, yeah. So if any of our listeners have got a copy of Beyond the Box, Margot Ledbetter, get in touch. We'd love to um, get a hold of it if we can. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. I, yeah. Um, I, I have a vague recollection of this, but I can't bring it to mind properly. So it would be it would be great to see it again. Apparently it was a steaming pile of shite, but it won't stop me wanting to watch it. No, that never. That's never. <laughs> when is that ever a thing? No, never, never. <laughs> that's no deterrent, is it? If anything, it makes me want to watch it more, just so I can yeah. fuel my bile. So, instead of a game this week, although I did consider Snog Marry a Void. <laughs> what with the um, characters of of the Good Life? Yeah, but I mean, it wouldn't fill much time, would it? You know, Snog Marry a Void. <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely marry Barbara, Snog Margot, avoid Tom, Mrs. Weaver. <laughs> 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 and I'm sure that your selections uh, are fairly obvious as well. Do you want to quickly do them? Um, I would um, snog Harry the Leak Thief. Yeah. Um, I would fella. avoid. Um, who would I avoid? Um, I've got a suggestion. <laughs> I bet you can guess who it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'd avoid that the next door neighbour that talks like Margaret Thatcher. Oh yeah, Mrs. Um, Weaver. Yes, and I would marry. I think I'd marry Jerry. Yeah, I'm surprised you even have to think about it. Yeah, of course you marry Jerry. Yeah. Anyway, there we go. That doesn't kill much time. So instead, because as as we alluded to last week, um, Margot as a sort of um, political commentator is coming into her own now, isn't she? She's making a lot of sort of soapbox, having a oh, lot yes. of soapbox moments and talking about. Um, the scourge of socialism and and, uh-huh. and she's also mentioning trade union leaders and mm-hmm. she's bringing sort of politics into it and um, she's going a bit top heavy with her sort of conservative views because yes. of that we thought we'd have a look this week um which may be a bit dry for our podcast but let's do it anyway <laughs> we thought we'd have a look at margot as a sort of template margaret thatcher and the role that some people believe that the character and her popularity played in helping the Conservatives come to power in 1979 with Margaret Thatcher at the helm. Let's get political, political. I want to get political. Let's get political. Margot Thatcher, Tory talk. I think this is, I think this is fascinating, a fascinating sort of um, idea that, that a character that was written for TV that was sort of a comic... Um, Something, to, not something to laugh at, but something to be almost ridiculed. Actually, perhaps bolstered that rise to power. Mm. Well, she's a parody, isn't she? Like most um, mm. most characters, she's an exaggerated version of the truth. However, mm. um, her views probably weren't exaggerated compared to Maggie. Um, the one thing we've got to be careful with, being like staunch left lefty liberal. Hmm. Um, is not to be too. I have to make sure I don't say anything too horrible about Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. We lose a load of listeners because she's a divisive figure. People love her. Um, silly people, in my opinion. But there you go. <laughs> so anyway, um, the first thing to say about this is when Richard Briers died, which was what two thousand and thirteen, fourteen, something like that. Um, when he died, the Spectator. Hmm. Yeah. Which is ostensibly a Tory mouthpiece anyway, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I'm off already. <laughs> Should I start again? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, the, the Spectator, it wrote an obituary for Richard Briars, mm. and it stated how important Briars slash Tom Good was to the Tories' rise. And they, ent- and they entitled this piece Richard Briars' Thatcherite Hero. Oh, right. Um, however, there was an immediate outcry, and I'm not sure if it was from his family... Um, but I know the piece was immediately shelved and then came back as a thinly reworked oh, okay. piece that sort of focused on focused on Margot instead. Really? That's really interesting. Yeah, I think, well, the thing is, Briars himself proudly stated several times in his life that he'd never voted Conservative. Mm. So I expect that, I mean, I'm sort of assuming here, but his family presumably sh- might have shared his values and might have been horrified in their grief mm. to be reading that he was a Thatcherite hero. What a really odd sort of conclusion for the spectator to draw, though. It's obviously someone that's not, not even bothered 
doing their research. Well, they create their, their own narratives, don't they? They certainly do. I'll tell you a little bit what, about what they said. So the spectator stated that the good life may have been ostensibly about suburban self-efficiency on the surface, but it also became a mirror for the fears and aspirations of the age. And in April 75, which is when the good life started, Thatcher just mm-hmm. become the Tory leader in opposition. So the spectator's um, viewpoint is that Margot quickly came to sound a lot like Mrs. Thatcher, presumably deliberately, I'm not sure. Maybe it was because mm. um, the writers may have latched on to the uh, to Margaret Thatcher's distinct speaking and oratory style. Um, but things like things that Margot says, like, I am the silent majority and um, I'm not a citizen, I am a resident, you know? It's very sort of familiar, isn't it? Very reminiscent. Well, it could have been sort of conservative battle cries, really, couldn't they? <laughs> yeah. For the time. Um, you know, for the frustrations that that um, faction of society had with uh, Europe that had just come in and mm. stuff like that. And the spectator goes on to claim that Margot was essentially Thatcher writ small, a harridan with a heart of gold voicing our growing frustration with ineptitude and ap- apathy. Wow. Um Heart of gold for Thatcher. Yeah, that's un- that's not deliberate, but it made me guffaw. Um, yeah. So I think it's a real stretch. I don't know about you. Some of it rings true. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, yeah, it's sort of as we're talking about it, sort of like week to week, and it's um all about the the jollity and the japes and stuff. It, it, it's quite um, I don't know. It feels quite a serious conclusion that's what i said it's it's quite dry for our podcast isn't yeah it? but um i think it's like you i think it's an interesting thing um mm. i think that the spectator it was a stretch but their angle really was that she was voicing the frustrations of many people at the time but in a sort of comedic and almost endearing way because she's so redeemable as a character i mean i'm paraphrasing the spectator here but i i kind of am on board with that to an extent um, mm. And I think that this was coupled with some other parallels between Margot and Margaret Thatcher in that, you know, the voice, the poshness, possibly may have helped people accept Thatcher as a leader of the Tories and increased her popularity and therefore helped her win the election in 79. Blimey. Maybe. But they also note that um, there are other sort of smaller things like um, urbane but ineffectual. Her husband, Jerry, was the archetypal Tory wet. <gasps> um, wow. Wow. Yeah, and yeah, I can sort of get on board with that. It's not actually dissimilar mm. to Dennis Thatcher, really, in some ways. Oh. Um, I just feel like it's all been subterfuge, subterfuge that I wasn't even aware of. Well, this is just their 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 take on it, isn't it? Um, to be honest, it's full of conjecture, and it's not even particularly mm. accurate. I mean, they state that there were three series of The Good Life when there were four. Oh, okay. So, you know, take it all with a pinch of salt. It's quite condescending, too, because towards the end... It's the same guy wrote the piece. It's the same piece reworked from the original about Richard Bryce. Yeah. And at the end, he writes, I met Richard Bryce twice and he was charming, but also far brighter than you might imagine. And I thought, why wouldn't I imagine that Richard Bryce... Why would you not think he was? I, I would I would assume that Richard Bryce was very bright. Yeah, just classist oh. um, superiority mm. and um, pomposity, isn't it? So anyway, um, the, oh. the piece ends with, he may have made a cracking leer... But The Good Life, the show which foresaw the rise of slow food, self-employment and Mrs. Thatcher, which obviously looking at the positive things of the Tory government, mm. is the most fitting monument to this unassuming yet gifted man. So it was still an obituary to Briars, just clumsily yeah. reworked. Hmm. Yeah. And there's, there's some other pieces I've found, if I can read them to you. Um, yes. Because obviously there's a lot of misty-eyed nonsense in this one, but there's um, the idea that Margot appealed to the inner snob in, in the 70s electorate and gave them voice... I guess it's kind of parallel, isn't it, to the populists that we have now? Yeah. Um, there's, there's parallels to the sort of very triumphalist attitude of the Brexit community, the the leavers. You know, they're very. Mm. Um, I suppose it's given them voice to sort of. What am I trying to say? Um, I'll just get back. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. Mm. Getting back to some of the things that I've read. Apparently, the Tory party higher ups were apparently delighted with Margot's mainstream presence as they felt it familiarised the electorate with a strong woman who wanted to shake things up and out of, out from the malaise. Oh. So even in the, within the Tory party, um, supposedly, they were they were glad that Margot was there on screen. And uh, it probably helped that, like Jerry, Dennis Thatcher was sort of a, a world-weary, henpecked husband standing back, letting a hyperactive middle-aged woman sort things out. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're shell shocked, though. I, I am. I just feel like I've had the wool pulled over my eyes for all the, all this time, and Margot was just like a a stooge. A, yeah, stooge maybe. A stooge to get to get the country on board with with something that turned out to be a bit horrific. They're the worst thing that ever happened to Britain, in our opinion. <laughs> Um, Jeez, yeah. I don't think she was a stooge because I don't think it was deliberate by the writers, but I think that it was... Do you not think they, they, they sort of changed the tack with it, that they could have like altered how how they portrayed her in order to lead people in a certain direction? I don't think they were trying to do anything other than parody in making her, okay. in making her similar to Thatcher, and they were just writing in a way that would um, resonate. And, and and be funny, okay. but um, it was just a happy coincidence for the Conservatives that it possibly aided them because um, it helped male voters particularly relate to this situation in the Ledbetter household as normal or at least acceptable, right. whereas previously perhaps they wouldn't have voted for such a bolshy, um, strong, independent yeah. woman, you know? And that certainly wasn't known in politics, was it, for a woman to be a leader up until Thatcher? God, that's so interesting. So I'll finish off on this, but there are a couple of other parallels, in, um, w- including the fact that Margot was a secondary character who ended up the breakout star who dominated the show. Yeah. And of course, the good life was supposed to be all about Richard Bryars. It was a vehicle for him um, when it was conceived. But Margot Blimey. came out of it as the most memorable character in the show. Um, personally, I'm uncomfortable with the idea, like you, that Margot helped humanise the monster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's it's bizarre because it's it it's not something that I've I've ever really considered or but it, it seems quite obvious now now that you've that you've set it out like that and the timing of of when the TV show was was on and her rise to power within the Conservative Party it's quite I think I don't know I think it's quite obvious. Well, culture plays a big part in politics and it's often um, happening on a, at a subconscious level in in mm. South American countries football influences elections you know okay um the argentina team winning the um world cup hugely helped in i think that was 78 hugely helped the argentinian government and um if it's an escapism for the masses so if they if football figures um champion a political figure then he's gonna he's gonna surge to power or remain in power over there and i think at, at a more mm. subconscious level in Britain in the 70s, this may have happened. And interestingly, just one final thing to say on this is that Penelope Keith, of course, went on to play an MP in the early 1990s sitcom No Job for a Lady. Ah, do you remember that? I think I do. Ran for a couple of seasons. I haven't really watched it. I may have seen some clips of it. Mm. But it's possible that she herself was actually trading on her association with Mrs. Thatcher in a way there. And Thatcher's, you know, she'd been in power a decade then. She'd actually yeah. just left power, I think, when this TV show, she'd resigned, which is something no one saw come in. Right. So there we go. Oh, yeah, very interesting. I um, There's lots to think about there, actually. Yeah. Should we do something a little bit less uh, political? Oh, we have to probably yeah. apologise to our, right, uh, our right-leaning listeners for our <laughs> getting a few digs in about Thatcher. Um, we're... we're Respectful of the fact that people will have different opinions on Margaret Thatcher, but we can't help letting... Well, I can't help letting my bias creep in. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's all up for discussion. It's all up for discussion and it's all it's all good. It's all okay. Yeah, and let us know if you think that the um, some of these things that I've just sort of read out make sense to you or there's other things that maybe there were parallels between the character Margot mm. and the Iron Lady. Have you seen that film? <laughs> I have. Um... What's she called? Meryl Streep. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen it. I won't watch it because it humanises us. So I won't watch it. Plus, I didn't much like um, the, the Iron Man 3, so I'm not going to watch the next one. <laughs> <laughs> I've stolen that joke, but it's a cracker, eh? <laughs> Do you want to... Um, should we have a little walkthrough of um, Series 3, Episode 4, I Talk to the Let's Trees? Let's do that. Good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life. Good life. Good life. Good life. So, in this episode, there's yeah, there's lots to um, lots to chat about in this episode. Um, we start off with Tom and Barbara are busy working in the garden and um, doing that 
little jockey thing that they do where they where they sort of rib each other and call each other, but they can hear chatting in the background, mm. and they're busy wondering who who it is. Who can they hear chatting away? And it turns out it's their it's their neighbour, Mister Wakeley. Well, I think they're at the allotment who, actually, aren't they? They're at their allotment. Uh, is, yeah. So it's, was it not their garden? Was it was it the, the the allotment that's off the off off site? I'd assume so. Otherwise, Mister Wakeley's a trespass, trespassing fucker, isn't he? <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah, because they're in the same they're in the same plot of land, aren't they? Course, yeah. so he's busy he's busy chatting to himself. I've got a bit of a side note here about Mister Wakeley. Sure, played by actor Noel Howlett, mm-hmm. who was also in A. P. Herbert's Misleading Cases. Do you remember from a few weeks ago? There was um, I remember you said it, that, was it, yeah. Was it Harry the Leak Thief? Yeah. Um, so obviously, the, uh, actors during the seventies. Um, playing bit parts, um, A.P. Herbert's Misleading Cases was obviously, um, it was like a big scoop that scooped up all 1970s bit parts. Um, and yeah, he was on there as well, apparently. Well, probably a lot of nepotism as well. I guess that the yes. showrunners pick people they know from other projects they've been involved in, probably. Yep. He wa- he rocked so the cravat, well. though, didn't he, this fella? Oh, he did. I liked Mr. Wakeley. What a lovely man. Yes, um, he's nice. He's, he's busy... Chatting away to himself, so Tom and Barb, I think. Um, but they knock on his greenhouse and they go and share a flask of tea with him and find out a bit more about who he's who he's chatting to. So Mr. Wakeley's panicking a little bit, thinking that Barbara and Tom think he's going a bit potty. Um, but then he tells them that he that he chats away to his to his fruit and vegetables to help them mm. help them to grow, which is lovely. Um, Tom is as you can imagine, very, very scathing at the beginning. Um, contempt prior to investigation, which Tom is um, very, very good at, not really understanding what's going on, but having a real sort of downer on, on, on what people are doing. He's always got an opinion, hasn't he? He has. Before exploring what it actually is, he's there with his opinion. And he was a bit like um, Jerry's Jerry's deadpan snark, actually, because he was making little remarks like, um, I think Mr. Waitley said Brotherhood of Creation. He said, didn't they win the Eurovision Song Contest? Yes, he did. He did. You know, he was um, he was taking a piss, especially when Mr. Waitley told his precocious cucumber that he was a show-off. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cute, and I think he was really lovely. He did ask, and he asked Tom, which I, th- I thought was really lovely, I'm not asking you to believe in it. All I'm asking you is to not disbelieve it. Mm. Which I thought was quite it's quite nice. And if we if we all did that with everything, then you know, there'd be a bit more harmony perhaps. So Tom and Barbara come away from 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 their meeting with Mr. Wakeley, um sort of with, with food for thought, pardon the pun, um, and jump onto the rotary cultivator and drive home, only to be met by a lot of kids in the street that chased yeah. them down the avenue, which I thought was brilliant. Yeah. Um sort of playing um Cowboys and Indians along the way. If you were a kid um, in the avenue, oh. I'd I'd love chasing Tom and Barbara around on their rotary cultivator. It looked great. You think they were wonderful, wouldn't you? Yeah. You think they were absolutely amazing. Although you have to say that that shitty vehicle of Tom's is probably responsible for the polar ice caps melting. No, <laughs> the current climate yeah. crisis. The amount of shit that was being churned out of it. They, they they get they get home and um, they're busy having a Tom and Barbara having a chat in the kitchen about the reminiscing about children and children's toys. Um, Barbara mentions that she has a nurse's set, which sets Tom's eyes off, swiveling round in his head, mm. getting all excited. Um, and then one of my favourite ever scenes in The Good Life when Margot arrives <laughs> in the kitchen and she says, "I've just come to say." Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> and she does the double whammy, Margot, um, and then turns on her heels and goes, which it, it was just perfect. Unexpected and, and perfect. I thought it was lovely. Hello, Margot. Good evening, Barbara. Good evening, Tom. <laughs> I have just come to say thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. I loved it. But prior to that, as as they arrived in the car, we saw her in the window yes. just sort of scowling out, and it was actually quite scary seeing this sort of figure in the window with a face like thunder. I thought if I was a kid running up and down, and I turned and saw that looming out of like a bay window, You'd be at me, yeah, shit me pants, I'd be running out. Mm. She's not happy. Is and she didn't have 
it didn't have did it have one of those um 1970s public information film swoops no into it the, did it not no oh, you would my, uh, you would have been traumatized if, if you'd had the, that yeah. the sound wouldn't you you don't like them do you oh no don't like that um they call her back into the kitchen and um margot gets on a bit of a snobby sort box about mm. children in the avenue um she she considers that these are children that would be perfectly happy on the council estate, not the avenue, um, and they've actually disturbed a meeting of the music society that's taken place at her house. Um, apparently, Margot's been persuaded to throw her hat in the ring um, to become the the leader of the music society, mm. um, whipping away the rug from underneath Miss Mountshaft, um, describing her as a spent force. Yes, it's a right wing coup, isn't it? It is. She's um, about to start a revolution. Um, Apparently, Miss Mountshaft is away on holiday and this is all being done behind her back. Tell you what, Tom seems genuinely interested in all this. He pulls a chair out and he says, oh. (laughs) He's like, he's proper gossipy little fucker, isn't he? (laughs) Tell me more, Marga. Did you notice the good's massive loaf of bread that looked totally fake? Is that what it was? I couldn't figure out what it was on the table. Was it a loaf and one of them other loaves of bread? Well, I think it was a piece of... Barbara makes. I think it was a hunk of brown plastic, to be honest with you. <laughs> but it was very it, it, unconvincing. Yeah. Ah, right, so it was supposed to be bread. Okay. I think it was. And then the, the colour of the peapod wine was quite sickening as well. It was sort of luminous, yellowy green. Is it not usually red? Yeah, I thought so. So... I thought it was burgundy. Or do they make different varieties? Well, they call it burgundy just as a piss take, I think. But oh, okay, right. Okay, oh, see, it's wasted on me that. Um, but yeah, I just thought, is what the hell's that they're supping? So the, the, the Tom and Barbara are, are, are chatting further now about um, the theory of talking to plants and whether it's worth even giving it a go. If if there's a possibility that it's going to increase their yield. Um, of of what they can produce, then I think Tom sort of thinks he has another rethink about it, um, and and decides that perhaps it is worth it's worth looking into, perhaps. Yeah, he's been ruminating on it, hasn't he, for a while, and he's decided yeah. that maybe, maybe Barbara was wrong to dismiss Mister Waitley oh, again. Honestly, <sighs> yeah. At one point, while they were having this argument, mm. a, oh, a little bit of a disagreement, and and he was gaslighting her. Yeah, Barbara says. She gives him a look and she says, do you know what I think, Tom? And I thought, she's going to call him out. She's, she's going to say, I think you're a fucking <laughs> or something. <laughs> so, it was just like, she was on board, basically. And I thought, oh, there was there was that slither. Even though I've seen the show so many times, I thought she was going to go. Missed opportunity. I've had enough of this shit. Pack your bags. <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> So they decide to set up an experiment to test whether um, playing music or um, talking to your plants is of use and does in, does it indeed help to increase the yield of, of what you could produce. So they have three different trays of, of plants, of seeds, and plant A will get 20 seconds of encouragement um, and sort of like nice chatty talking to. Uh, B is going to be the control plant with nothing, just just out there in the open, and C is going to be um, subjected to deri- deri- derision and hate, mm. which is awful. Poor plant C. Well, Barbara's not happy, um, is she? No, they've got the, these are these are runner beans. Um, Barbara gets the the chance to be um, in charge of plant A, which she calls Douglas. Eventually, she calls it. I think she probably is more suited to being in charge of Plant A because she definitely wasn't happy that Plant C was going to get this abuse. Yeah. And, and Tom, being very officious with his clipboard, he sort of said, well, we'll make it up make it up to it after the experiment. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite a funny line. It is. Barbara's um, 20 seconds of encouragement sort of tipped over into weird, weird, <laughs> just weird... Eroticism. Weird chatter. Yeah. Um, not just love and encouragement, but it got a bit overly sexual yeah. with the, with the runner bean seeds. Very, very weird. That bean seed probably got an instant semi on when she started yeah, talking no in that husky voice. That much. You know what I mean? Ah, I had to mention Barbara's husky voice in this episode yeah. as well. It was it, whether she had like some kind of throat infection. She must have done. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, you say that. I think <laughs> in this very scene. <laughs> 
Not mm-hmm. only, not, I mean, Barbara's voice throughout was a bit was a bit buggered throughout the episode, but yeah. in this very scene, I don't know if you noticed, but Tom has got snot on his lip. <laughs> no. On it, go back and look at it. In between, under his nose, on his upper lip, he's covered in snot. Is he really? Yeah, he's got a big shiny, like a dew drop. Modern day HD TVs probably don't do him any favours that you wouldn't have noticed in the seventies. But he's yeah, he's glistening. <laughs> he's glistening oh, on his upper lip. I will. I will. I will revisit. So maybe the entire cast were ill. Pampas grass. <laughs> um, but Tom gets very jealous of of Barbara and and the pea the pea the runner beans. Yeah. Um. She she yeah. He's he's not happy with this overtly overtly sexual chatter with the with the um plants. Um. But the, in the meantime, they're interrupted by Jerry, who comes in, yelling "Sanctuary, sanctuary!" So he's obviously broken away from whatever Margot's doing yeah. um, and needs just a bit of respite. Um, but apparently she's got the music society in and that's what he's, that's what he's trying to get away well, you from. you would, wouldn't you? Um, oh, I can imagine. It must, yeah. Um, so he just wants somewhere quiet to come and sit. Um, but he, he's obviously walk, walked in while they're in the midst of this, um, this experiment with the runner beans, um, which they carry on. Um, Jerry's thinking that Tom needs to go to an institution um, and he's quite scathing, isn't he, of the of the experiment that they're doing? Yeah, when Mister Waitley's mentioned, Jerry asks yeah. if he's Percy Throwers, if if uh, if he's Percy Throwers his mentor or something. Yeah, and I just love the name Percy Thrower. Percy Thrower, I remember Percy Thrower from the Blue Peter Garden. He was the Blue Peter well, Garden dude. Titchdale yeah. like, likes to think he's Percy Thrower, but he's not fit to lace Percy Thrower's boots. Percy Thrower. <laughs> And don't get me onto Monty Don. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've had Monty Don before, yeah, haven't yeah, we? Fucker, yeah, fucker, yeah. Slagging off. Don't you say anything about Felicity Kendall. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jerry. So Jerry Jerry just about has his fill of all this um, and cuts his losses and decides he wants to go for a plowman's at the pub instead. Oh, yeah. Of stopping for lunch round at the goods. I got, I got quite peckish, actually, when he started talking about a plowman's. Um yeah. It was, a plowman's is something I haven't had in years, but a bit of bread and cheese. I know, but I would exactly. It's not something I would ever order if I went out for a meal to a to a pub. But I, oh, I could go. I could well go a plowman's. Did uh, your dad ever make that joke when you'd be? Oh, I think I'll have plowman's. Will he mind? <laughs> <laughs> Don't think he did. No. Classic dad joke. It is a bit of a dad joke. But I want to give special mention here, though, to Tom's uh, Tom's abuse that he gave plant. Plant C or whatever it was called. Oh, yeah. I thought he did it so well, um, Richard Bryars. He did. He sort of, yeah. Before he did the abuse, he turned away and did this like Machiavellian dramatic turn <laughs> and then just started throwing like insults and throwing abuse. bile at this plant. And I thought it was hysterical. <laughs> I do hope they made it up to Plant C because, yeah, it was, um, it was quite vicious, weren't it? Yeah, a little bit. Oh, but. It, not long after the beans are growing, Barbara is absolutely thrilled that that the the shoots are growing. Um, and she's like I said, she's named the love bean Douglas, which has grown the biggest. She's cock a hoop. Yeah, absolutely. Tom pulls out a gramophone player, mm. like an old record player that plays seventy eights, um, and begins playing records to the beans. Yeah, um, like Mister Wakely did, which I thought was quite sweet. We next head to Margot and Jerry's lounge where the Music Society sit in wait for Margot to arrive down. I'm guessing she's upstairs getting ready because she comes downstairs with the... She's, she's got the, the poodle hair again. Yeah, she's with making the a grand hair. entrance, isn't she? Oh, blimey, yeah. So they're all sat waiting. Jerry's really embarrassed and just keeps saying, Margot, will be here in a moment. Yeah, and what's behind him? Uh, oh, what what is behind him? On the sideboard, a load of pampas grass. Oh, the pampas grass! The pampas grass! <gasps> Do you know what? I'm mm. beginning to think this this meeting is a little bit of a um, facade for something altogether yeah. more overtly sexual. Is it a hybrid? Yeah. M- music slash swinging? Well, if you were in, genuinely, if you were in the 70s and you invited a load of people to your house, male and female, and you stood there with your blazer on <laughs> and your pampas grass swaying behind you, what would they yeah. think? Yeah. So- it only means one thing. Yeah. 
They've obviously just waited till Miss Mountshaft is out the country because they don't much fancy picking up the keys and <laughs> ed- edding into the sack with her. She must be the, you know, the pig of the group. <laughs> so in floats Margot. Um, the meeting is to decide on the new president of the society. Uh, there's two candidates, um, Margot being one of them. Yeah. Miss Mountshaft's on holiday in Greece. Um, one of the group does sort of voice their concern that they feel it's a bit un- underhand that Miss Mountshaft is out of the country and he's like unable to sort of counteract this happening. Um, mm. It's all going on behind her back. Um, and this guy feels that they're, they're sort of sticking the knife in a little bit. Which they definitely are. Well, yeah, a little bit. Is this Mr. Chip Chase? I think... Mr. Yes, the one, yes. Don't you think that sound? He looks a bit like Eric Morecambe with his glasses. Oh, he does. Look... Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, with his specs. And he was clearly a, a benevolent yeah. character, but Chip, Chip Chase sort of sounds like an evil name to me. Chip Chase. Do you think? Yeah. Or do you think it's more. Mm. He sounds like, you can imagine like a barren Chip, Chip Chase. Yeah, I think it, it, I I understand where he's coming from, um, but he it, it just he it just seems like a bit of a snivelly character, you know, like a bit of an ass licker. Yeah, and he doesn't have a chance, actually, does he, against Margot? But I understand where he's coming from. I I do agree that it is a bit underhand. Oh, definitely, but he just doesn't have a chance mm. against Margot. No, he doesn't. She she's a force, isn't she? Oh, yeah, she's totally in charge again of this situation. And actually, she asks Jack very Thatcher esque. And politics her way around this um, she does. situation. Oh God, it's all becoming clear. Um, well, Bar- Baron Chip Chase um, <laughs> is put in his place. Why is it? Hold on. Why is it that evil people are always barons? barons. Baron Greenback, Baroness Thatcher. <laughs> Look, at, I'm on the, <laughs> the soapbox again. Um, actually, Dolly Mountshaft. Which is the name yes. of the woman as she Margot's trying to displace. That's all Mountshaft mm. is also a great name for a baron, isn't it? Baron Mountshaft. Yeah. Baron Mountshaft. But she does you you're absolutely right. She does she she does politic her way through this. Mm. Um even down to promises of, of checks, of money. Mm. Um she promises the group two hundred pounds from Jerry. <laughs> only if only if she's elected. And she If she's elected. And she also does yeah, that ins- insincere sort of speech about how wonderful Dolly Mountshaft has been for the music society. Oh. You know, it's so political. It is. It is. She's um, a political genius. I'm coming to understand. Yeah. So when Margot's finished her sort of pitch to become the new president, um the music from Tom and Barbara's house that they're playing for the um for their experiments with the with the seeds um comes wafted into the house and Margot loses a shit really doesn't she mm. um she tells them that you've ruined my election campaign and she's so cross with them she, well she's cross but Barbara if anything because obviously Margot's burst in and started screaming mm. screaming and overreacting when Douglas was supposed to be receiving his um Erotic pep talk from Barbara. <laughs> yes. Um, so Barbara's e- uh, overreaction even dwarfs Margot's. She is fuming. It does. She says, "Oh, Margot, I could murder you sometimes mm. because she's come in and she's she's ruined the experiment." But then Jerry turns up and informs Margot in the meantime that she's been voted president by the group Um, (laughs) and Margot soon she just yeah just climbs back down off that high horse and kisses everyone Um, she's thrilled to bits with the idea of becoming um, the president of the music society and all's well again in Margot land the the Stunting of the experiment by Margot. Um, Jerry sort of steps in as usual with his wallet, um, and says, "I can, I can sort of pay. What, what, what's, what's it worth? What can I give you? Um, to, to sort of sort out what Margot's done." Um, and Barbara just says, "Tuppence." Yeah, Tom looked like he was about to rip Jerry off. Tom looked like, "What, what yeah. are you going to get away 40 with?" Quid. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Barbara does the right thing. Ooh. I like Richard Bryers. I like Richard Bryers. I like Richard Bryers. I like Richard Bryers. 
Good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life. Then they're outside with the re- with the record player, with the gramophone, um, playing music in the garden, um, and they discuss the, the the prospect of playing it around Geraldine to see if it can increase her milk yield. Um, and what about chickens and eggs? Um, has it got any effect? But then it, it turns out that the chickens have produced some enorm- enormous eggs yeah. based on the fact that they've been listening to the music. I mean, it was it was a gigantic egg, wasn't it? It was. That poor chicken. Imagine that coming out of your ass. Mm. Have I ever told you about my um, idea to... Um, <laughs> no, I've never, I've never laid an egg, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've laid a few cables in my time. But um, <laughs> no, I had an idea years ago. Well, it was a sort of like hmm. fever dream, actually, about... Right. Um, this is probably too disgusting to put in the podcast, so I might cut it out. But um, you know the way, like, effectively, an egg is a, is a chicken's period. Yes. So I thought to myself, if, you, if, you, if, if humankind could develop a tablet, like, mm. just distill some sort of potion that uh, ladies could take during their during their cycle so that instead yes. of all the drama and hassle that comes with the monthly period they just yeah. laid a squat just, laid just every now and squat and just do a nice little leg <gasps> would you be on board with that oh yeah god yeah that would be so much easier so so much nicer and cleaner and easier to deal with and it's just pop squat oh, out egg done I was having this fever dream and I thought to myself I actually woke up thinking that I was now going to become a millionaire because I was going to develop this this tablet. Develop some way of doing it. Yeah, and I was like marketing oh. it in my head, thinking like extra little bonus, um, free omelet. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> it would. It oh, see it it. it uh, a woman would would come up with that idea and think it was wonderful, but it would it would possibly need a man to implement it. Do you think? And make it happen. Yeah. Well, I'd like to say I'm the guy, but I have no science skills whatsoever. <laughs> no, just come up with the ideas. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the idea you, you man. You don't ring someone. I'm the idea man. I'm not the hands-on man. <laughs> There's a couple of things I wanted to talk about that we that okay. we didn't cover. One was it was nice to hear that the runt is doing well. That was mentioned. Oh yes. Because you don't get that level of continuity in episode callback in most sitcoms, do you? Certainly from no, that era. No, you don't. And because it was such a big, a big story as well. Yeah, it's nice to hear. And and also, um, as well as um, the run doing well, I was interested to see that for like the second time in what two or three weeks, Tom was threatening to smash faces in again. <laughs> he said the same line again. Yeah, the IRD this time. I'll, I'll smash their faces. <sighs> Very violent. Yeah, I think he's got maybe some anger management issues he needs to address. Yeah, he can turn on a on a sixpence, can't he? From being sort of quite genial and to smashing someone's face. And if you think back to that time, he he was chasing the fisherman around. Oh God, yeah. And he's just a court, yeah. He's a fucking nutter. <laughs> Lock him up, like at the Trump rallies. Lock him up. Lock him up. <laughs> oh dear me. Where are we going now? <laughs> Let's go to Fashion Corner. Fashion Corner, Fashion Corner. Fashion Corner, Fashion Corner. So we've, we've got numerous um, fashion entries this week from, from Margot. Um, initially, at the beginning, when she does her double whammy Margot of um, thank you very much, goodbye, um, in the goods kitchen, she's got a, like a brown pinstripe dress like almost like suit material dress um like with it with quite a long sort of 1970s collar with a big yellow rose which is quite lovely Ooh. and considering the i think a yellow rose is um i'm sure it's a pea, a piece thing a yellow rose oh, is it um and as she'd come in to stamp her feet and get a bit cross about council council kids mm. on the avenue um seemed a bit of a contradiction in terms but there you go um jerry's um leather jacket made another appearance um as it does in most episodes um i always yeah i'm always happy to see the the tan leather jacket 
Um, when Margot comes in for the Music Society meeting about her becoming president, she sort of floats in in this pink, beautiful, floaty dress. Um, it's trimmed with tassels, um, with tassels down the front, and she's got a hair all curled again. In that room at the meeting, there is quite a lot of um, fashion on display from other members. Um, there's a green flowery dress um, that's, that's just worthy of note um, in the Music Society audience. Jerry, in, in that meeting, when he was sort of standing around looking awkward with his buttonhole and his blazer... Yes. Um, he, he sort of looked a bit Alan Partridge-esque, I thought, at that moment. I can see that. Do you think... It, was that more the outfit or was that more the um, uncomfortable nature of... Bit of both. Standing about. Bit of both, yeah. yeah. He looked like he was going to... Uh... Shout, Dan. Yeah. Dan! 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 Go and get his, go and get his big plate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there was another, oh, another bit of fashion in this episode I enjoyed was, was right. Mr. Waitley's pocket watch. Ah, uh, I do like a pocket watch. Hmm. I, I own one. But I, 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 actually don't, I don't wear it because I've got no pockets. I've got no. I've got. I don't wear jackets. Stick it in your jeans. Yeah, I'm always in a t-shirt, <laughs> aren't I? I can't just tuck it down my tits, and whip it out from there. <laughs> just pull it out. Yeah. I can... Did you wear it? Did Did you wear it when you were a kid? With you walking? No, I've never worn it. Um, it was left to me. It was Aww. left to me by my granddad, I think. And I don't yeah. even have it in the country. My mum's got it in the UK. Because literally, right. I've got nowhere to put it. I could tuck it into my undercrackers, <laughs> just pull it over there. Yeah, that's it. We don't. I don't think people. Would, they don't tend to wear like three-piece suits anymore, do they? Where you could just no. Tuck it in like I don't know. I did always want one because yeah. I used to like Alf Garnet's one in in Citizen in Health. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but there you go. Yeah, I enjoyed Mister Wakeley's pocket watch. I thought he was a dapper, dapper yeah. fella, and a lovely guy. He was a lovely character. He was lovely. And on that note, have you got an MVP for this episode, Ben? I do. Who's who is it? Who's your MVP? Margot. Is it? Yeah. I mean, despite okay. despite her politicking and underhand activities, well, she's just such a, con- a contradiction, isn't she? As a character, she's she's mm. deplorable in some ways, but she's also obviously got um, a great friend too. Tom and Barbara, and she's capable of great acts of kindness. But I just thought, for for the way she achieved what she wanted to achieve, yeah, yeah, she's a she's a force, isn't she? That's exactly what I was going to say. Force majeure. She's just mm. something to behold. Oh, yeah. Um, and we beheld it this week. Yes, indeed. What about you? Yes, indeed. Um, well, you know how I like to choose characters that sort of <laughs> encourage. <laughs> I know them. where you're going now. <laughs> Encourage the other characters, the the sort of main four, yeah. to um, sort of just think about things a little bit differently, and to uh, characters that throw other things into the mix. Um, so my MVP Chip for this chase. week is Mister Wakeley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Baron Chip Chase. Baron Chip Chase. No, it's Mister Wakeley um, for introducing um, such like a radical new idea that the, the goods then incorporate in their in their self sufficiency thing um at home. Um and uh, yeah, I always like to sort of see see the story get nudged on a little bit, um and the inclusion of, of like an outside um influence in order to do that. And I quite liked him. I thought he was quite dapper. He was quite cute. He was sweet. With his little radio and his tomatoes. Yeah. I definitely Mr. Wick. Effectively he's just a MacGuffin, isn't he? He is. He is, but I, I quite I quite appreciate a MacGuffin. If he's well done. Yeah. Um, and he was, which I think the ones the, the ones that we've met so far um, in the Good Life, I find uh, they're not just sort of like stoogy parts. They they are there to serve a purpose, which I quite like. And I thought he was a the good pig one. pimp um, served his purpose. The pig pimp, yep. I didn't like the um, the leak thief. Yeah. Yeah. Although I thought you said you'd snog him earlier. <laughs> Can make your mind up. Fickle. I'm just fickle. Yeah. I think did I even vote? No, I didn't vote for him as the MVP that week. Did no, I? No, I did. I did. Yeah. Did you? Because I made a li- oh, I, it was a limerick. I had a limerick about him. Right, yeah. yeah, but yeah, I am. I am um, a sucker for a, a MacGuffin. 
thought you were going to say sucker for Harry the Leak Thief. I was going to say <laughs> it was snog, marry, avoid, not suck, marry, avoid. <laughs> oh, dear me. No. Sorry. I th- unnecessary. Well, right. uh, now, I'm very excited. Look, I've got oh. jazz hands and everything. Um, yeah. I'm very excited because next week's episode, do you know what it is? I do. Although I don't think I've written it down. It's a, oh, it's the windbreaking yeah. one. Yeah. Not windbreaking, it's the windbreaker. The, the windbreak war is the actual title of the episode. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and you know what that means, don't you? Should I? <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's where they nearly swing. <gasps> yes, because I've watched it and there is lots of... Lots to pull apart next week about about swinging and pampas grass. We could probably do an hour just um, on just on the scenes where they're drunk and flirting with each other. Oh, it's yeah, it's um, it's a good episode. It really is. Um, I don't, I don't like the idea of them sort of swapping partners. Though it does, it, it it makes me uncomfortable. Does it? Oh well. Mm. Well, I'll enjoy but, but, it. I'll yeah. enjoy it because I'm a sick puppy. We'll still deep dive. Yeah. Oh, I, I just, I, uh, it's like your mum and dad thinking about your mum and dad doing it. What with who? You mean swapping with someone? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. But you're the one with pampas grass in your garden, so... No, I've not got it in my garden. <laughs> no. <sighs> so if you're enjoying listening along with us and watching A Good Life and um, refreshing your memory of what a great show it was, um, get involved with us. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram, at Sado Podcast. And it's worth following us because we do post rare videos and images and... Clips from history of Richard Bryars and Penelope Keith and all of those guys. So it's definitely worth following us on there. We've also got a Facebook page where you can find the same um, guff. Search Sado Podcast to find that. You can subscribe to our newsletter by visiting our website at sado.club, where you can also find out a little bit more about us and read some of our blog posts. And you can also listen to episodes on the website if you uh, if you're so inclined. Get in touch with us and tell us what we've missed or what idiots we are for some of our <laughs> conclusions. That's fine too. Um, you can email us at sadopodcast at gmail dot com. And also, it's great if you could please subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcast, whether that be iTunes or Podcast Addict or wherever it might be. Just leave us a review and it'll help us get found. Where are you going now? <laughs> well it's evening for you so I imagine you're going to bed and I'll have to do a day's work I am it's um yeah it's bedtime here okie doke well thanks for listening and join us again next week we'll see you then I'll see you then